brought something else. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, you are the light who shone upon those who were in darkness, and they were illumined. Upon the blind, they recovered their sight. Let your face now shine on us, and we shall be illumined by you. Walk in the way of our gospel teachings, and glorify the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Mary, pray for us. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Steve. So, of course, the first question is, is how many of you join your Lent and Calvary? To encourage two other Maronites to read the Patriarch letter. Since we still have three copies left up there, and I only made 18, which means that there's 50 people who didn't even bother picking up one. Oh my God. I did two. You did two of them? Oh, so that means there's 51 people who couldn't even bother picking it up. I have one. So they get a chance to read it. Because of course, Lent's, Lent's practically done. We're, we only have a week and a half left. Then, the other thing that I did is I could take an hour in the morning and read in the books. This is good. So we're we'll back in the book in the uh, first the week of Easter. So what we're going to do then, first of all, as a reminder, if you haven't been to the, um, the benediction of the cross for Lent, this is the last one this Friday. Next week, of course, is Good Friday. So this Friday is the last chance to be at the benediction of the cross, which we've had every single Friday. But if you haven't been to it, at least try to make it for this one. And then, of course, we have all the ceremonies next week. So next Wednesday will be the rite of the lamp. And so that will be next Wednesday evening. But then, in Bright Week, for Easter, we'll be back again with our class meeting. I don't know what the heck's going on in the kitchen. Can you find out? I can't talk with them. They think they're sneaking out there and they don't realize they're making more noise. Yeah, it's like the whole back of the church who can't hear, so they think they're whispering. It's like they're shouting across the church. <laughs> I saw an article on Alatia that said, asked the question, is it a sin to talk during Mass? I didn't read it yet, though, but I'm going to yeah, there you go. All right. So what we're going to do then, but I'm going to introduce you to a new idea this evening, and then we'll finish up the Patriarch's letter and its practical application at the end. And one of the notion is priesthood. We all know the priesthood of the priest, but we also know that in the scriptures, the church is referred to as the church of the firstborn. And in the Mathra of St. James, we refer to the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. So there's a very great importance placed upon the firstborn. In fact, our Protestant friends, because our Lord is called firstborn in the scriptures, they're like, well then, see, there's other children. This is a legal title, firstborn. It doesn't matter if there's any other child born after you, this son is the firstborn. And as we know, in the Middle Eastern context, when we mention the brothers and the sisters of our Lord, these are again his extended family. They're not necessarily uterine <coughs> brothers and sisters. And so, the term of firstborn is very important, and it links with Adam. The reason why the church is called the church of the firstborn is because each of them have, by their baptism, this privilege to be able to sanctify. That's the priesthood. 
That's what Adam was supposed to do in the garden. He was supposed to represent all of humanity. He was humanity with Eve. And he was meant to render blessing to God and thanksgiving to God. So I'm going to introduce you in the evening, this evening to um, St. Ephraim's idea, what is the fall? What is actually taking place in the fall? So that what happens then is we see the firstborn and that ability to sanctify that is within families. And we talked about that, oh, I don't know, a couple months ago in the sermons on the priesthood of the patriarchs, the firstborn sons, the patriarchs, why this was an important issue for them. Because the priesthood, the ability to sanctify in that generation was in those fathers and their firstborn sons passing on generation to generation. In Christianity by baptism, what happens then is that all of, this is why St. Peter calls it, uh, why St. Paul will call it in the letter to the Hebrews, the church of the firstborn, but he also refers to it, um, St. Peter refers to it as being a nation of priests. And the nation of, <clears throat> a nation of priests and the a priestly nation, excuse me. <coughs> And what he's talking about is by the consecration of baptism, each individual has the ability and the obligation for their own personal life, but their personal life has a radiance in this creation, to sanctify, make holy. This is the reason why we do our morning prayers. This is the reason why we pray in the evening. This is the reason why we say grace at table. This is the reason why we make our thanksgiving at table. We render sanctification of the things that are around us. That is augmented by the sacrament of matrimony where this young man and this young woman become a reflection of and an extension of Christ and the church. At that point, that man is not just simply a consecrated member of a priestly nation, which is the church. He is also the one who sanctifies within his domestic household. Right? Blesses his children when they go to bed, for example. That notion of priesthood is also part of that. But that's not the universal priesthood, which is an extension of our Lord, which, of course, is the ministerial consecration of the sacrament of holy orders, which is universal. The priests consecrate everything. And so um, even within the sacrament of matrimony, that extension is it for what we nowadays call the domestic church, that assembly to bring forth life for a new generation to educate. Everyone's here now, right? One more is coming. It took ten, 10 minutes for us to warm the tenant. Yes. So then, how would that really be addressed to say um, a single oh, mother? I mean, who really does. Well, that's why it's always been considered an abnormality. You know, a single mother may be in a situation and we may need to help her, but it's always considered abnormal. But even a single father having his children. Mm -hmm. The normal relationship is not there. Well, I mean, who would take over doing the, the consecration? Well, obviously there's no domestic priesthood because there's no sacrament of matrimony. Well, I'm talking about for like a widow. Insofar as, you know, her consecration by her baptism, she can render those things in her personal life holy. But it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. This is why the sacrament of matrimony has a great importance, because it's a reflection and an extension of Christ in the church. Okay? So, the reason why we're introducing this is because I'm going to give you a reference in St. Ephraim. And I'm using the translation of Mary Hansberry, H-A-N-S-E-U-R-Y, Hansberry, of some of the hymns of St. Ephraim. When you read them, they're referred to as being table blessings. But like they go on forever. So they're not, they're hymns, they're what's called a memoro. They're a form of Syriac um, poetry. And so the notion of Adon as being firstborn, the first created, created and then placed in paradise to take care of it. Remember again, Adam, Adom, when he's created, we are told by Genesis that he's placed in paradise because there's two, there's two versions of the creation of mankind. One, Adam is created from the soil, and another one, Adam is created male and female. Adam is placed in the garden, placed in paradise, in order 
to tend it and to take care of it, to keep it. There's an intelligent consciousness that is introduced into the garden, and Adam as the firstborn in this instance in creation, being born, being created, he is meant to exercise a priesthood of rendering thanksgiving to God in the name of all of the non-intelligent animals around him. Which is why in Genesis it talks about that all the animals are brought to Adam. It's not saying all the billions of different animal life on earth had to march up and look him in the eye. It means that he has knowledge, he names them, he knows them. This is part of the knowledge given to Adam. And Adam is meant to render this thanksgiving and praise to God um, for all mankind. And for, in fact, for all of creation. All right? So this is what he's supposed to do, tending the garden. And obviously, as we know in this story, he fails. He fails. For St. Ephraim, the way we approach God is through praise and wonder. We stand in awe before God, and we render praise. We render thanksgiving. All right? So the idea when Adam is created in grace, he is created in union with God, is to understand that humanity from the beginning was created in grace and in holiness from the beginning. This was it. And we mentioned to you before, no human being from that day is simply pure nature. It doesn't exist. You're either in the state of sin or you're in the state of grace. There never has been a state of pure human nature. In philosophy, we talk about human nature, but pure human nature, just alone, as being just simply the flesh, living in the flesh, has never existed in any kind of a neutral sense. From the beginning, mankind was created first in union with God. All right? And Adam, in that sanctification, was meant to render grace to all creation through his presence. That's part of his tending and keeping of paradise. This is going to link up after Easter when we come back to the doctrine of the two spirits, the, shedding, the two ways, the two paths. So, question. Yes. Was Adam the first priest? Sorry? Was Adam the first Absolutely. priest? Absolutely. That's, that's the whole meaning of this. Yeah. Yep. So, I'm going to give you the Latin word for priest. Sacerdos, or sacerdos. It, it's where we get our word sacerdotal. That comes from it. Priest is a Greek, is an English corruption of the Greek word presbytero, or elder. Okay. So, what I want to point out in the word sacerdos is that it's a combination uh, in Latin of sacra do. Do means I give. Right. Data, the word data, is the plural neuter form of things given. Data just means those things which have been given. That's what the word data means. Do is to give. Do dare, to give something. So this term, sacerdos, literally means to render or to give sacred things. That's the idea behind the Latin word for sacerdos. But it's a good portrayal of the idea of what Adam was supposed to be doing in the garden. And that union with God was meant to be in its permanent place, rendered then from generation to generation. Because all the children should have been conceived in grace and should have been born in grace. In other words, the Immaculate Conception was not meant to be a unique miracle in the history of mankind. Okay? And so, this, because of the inward pull of this dialogue that goes on with the serpent and Eve, and Adam, Adam follows the same course of it, that in doing so, there is an inward self-interest which they exercise by disregarding that you can partake of all of the trees of the garden except the knowledge of good and evil. We've mentioned that in the now the Semitic contrast of two extremes, good, evil, it has the meaning of the knowledge of all things. 
You are never going to be omniscient, and this is not your course. This is disregarded by Adam and Eve, specifically Adam. If Adam hadn't fallen, Eve, a sinner, would have still conceived children in the state of grace and union with God. Okay? So what happens here is Adam fails in his priesthood. He fails in rendering what is meant to be sacred, conscious recognition of God in creation. And also, therefore, in failing in his priesthood, St. Ephraim will say that he did not render thanks. He did not, he was ingrateful. He did not render thanks. And so this is the origin of the notion of the first, of the father, the firstborn, the firstborn inheritance, and therefore this ability in each generation to render what is sacred. This is the importance of the story behind Abraham meeting Melchizedek. We did a couple months ago in the sermons. Because Melchizedek is not Abraham's father. And yet Abraham recognizes a priesthood in him which seems to be distinct from this paternal order. And that's why in the Psalms, being used by Solomon and David, by Solomon, is that you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. It already prophesizes a shift and a change. Israel is the first time when this notion of priesthood changes. Because what happens there is the priesthood is not from father to son in Israel, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, are taken uniquely as being the firstborn of God. And they exercise the priesthood and the temple worship within Israel. Which is why the Levites have no designated territory in Israel. Because, as it says in the scriptures, I am their portion. God is what, they're not given land because what belongs to them is God and God owns them. So that notion of dedicating the firstborn, dedicating, that whole notion of priesthood is focused on the one tribe of Levi within Israel. And that's the way it continues up until the time of our Lord. Okay? Because it's an important thing to understand because, of course, our Lord is born of the tribe of Judah. He's not even of the tribe of Levi. And yet he exercises an eternal priesthood. That's a whole other thing we'll get to later on. The important thing is to understand the way that God created Adam in the beginning was meant to be a sacerdotal existence. And if you understand that, then you understand that when God renews Israel and makes the new Israel of God, why Peter calls it a priestly nation? Because there's a restoration through the consecration of these individuals by their baptism, to be able to be restored to rendering thanks to God and to render things sacred within their lives by their own personal consecration. So there is a restoration, in a sense, um, to one degree or another, of Adam's original purpose. Right? And that's why then the body of Christ, the church, the priestly nation, is that exercising to the degree through baptism, that's what gives you the possibility of being present at the Eucharist. And that's why for the first centuries of the church, if you were not baptized, you were never in the assembly. You were not in even the building, okay? At least for the part of the sacrificial aspect of the Eucharist. Because you don't have the ability to participate in it because you are not consecrated, you are not baptized, okay? So, what happens here then is this restoration of, through baptism, of this original position of paradise. This is part of the idea of the return to paradise to the great land. Okay? Dale. Were women able to be baptized in those times? Well, of course. Of course. Yeah. And were they allowed to be in the church? Of course. Okay. And the ladies section. Yeah, of course, up until the, really the 20th century, most of the most of the church around the world, up until the 20th century, men were on one side, women were on the other. That's actually even just from the practice of the synagogue. So that's the 
in, in Ireland up until the 1960s, the women are on one side, men were on the other. That's a different question. That's, that's oh, no, no, but I was wondering if they were allowed to be baptized. Well, were, yeah, but of course they were baptized. Yeah, they had to be baptized. That's the only path to redemption. They were baptized. And, and that priestly nation, insofar as women are baptized, of course, that's what allows everyone to be able to participate in the sacraments. That's what we call the priesthood of the faithful. As infants are they baptized, or when, they're, when they reach the age of reason? I don't know, the infant, the, well, the infant's not, you know, it doesn't reach the age of reason, so it doesn't exercise that, but it's consecrated still. Well, no, but I was just wondering when they were baptized, was it as, you know, as infants or once they reached the age of reason? Oh, no, as infants, yeah. All right, so it's just one of those angles to talk about what Christianity means profoundly. It's not just simply a club that has religion attached to it. It is a profoundly, it is a profound vision of a restoration of what humanity is supposed to have been from the very beginning. This is why the story of Genesis the story of the creation of mankind is not some kind of silly story that we've all outgrown. On the contrary, <laughs> it is a complete uh, understanding of where humanity was originally supposed to be. And so that's why in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, St. Paul refers to the church as being the church of the firstborn. Everyone's firstborn. They have all the privileges of receiving the blessings of their father, and who is their father? Well, of course, the hidden God of creation. And therefore, we had it as a reading last, I think last Friday. You know, therefore, if you are co-heirs with Christ, if we have a sibling relationship with God incarnate, therefore we are also heirs of the kingdom. That's the whole foundation of the idea of going to heaven. If you don't have baptism, you're not a co-heir. If you're not a co-heir, you don't go to heaven. Right? This is the church's doctrine. It sounds brutal in the 20th century because, of course, we, we have mushy thinking about what the gospel actually is. But this is also the meaning when we understand it, the profound importance of what baptism truly is, that healing of the spirit. Yes? When I was a kid, there was such a place as limbo. Yep. I think we were all taught that. Yes. Then they got rid of limbo, didn't they? So what the heck's going well, on with that? Lim limbo is a part of what we call hell. I mean, limbo, hell is just the lower, it's a state of separation. It's not the vision of God. But to and punish so anything, a child. Then... Anything which is separate from that vision of God, which is the destiny intended by God for every human being, anything separate from that is, the, is a lower existence. But it's punishing a child whose parents did not live. We're not going to go there because I'll spend the next hour trying to explain it. But right does it, do they still teach us that Absolutely. it exists? It still exists. Okay, I thought it was. Oh yeah, no, no, gone. no. No, we'll get we'll get to it eventually. But the problem is that you tangent. No, it's because of me. It's not because your question is excellent. I do tangents of tangents, and we never get anywhere. Right? We have to finish the patriarchs letter before the end of Lent, right? So <laughs> I don't want to be doing this in Easter. But it's a good question. But limbo comes from the word limino. It's the area of threshold. It literally, limbo literally means in Latin a threshold. They are separate but they're at the edge, but they're still in a lower state of existence. Purgatory is part of hell. Damnation is, is the essence of hell. That state of separation from God. People in the state of mortal sin are already in that separation. They are already beginning hell. Hell in Saxon just means lower. It means a hole. And so it's referred to as being the grave. In Hebrew we say Sheol, all right? Going down to Sheol. Sheol is the place of the dead, it's the grave that your body gets put into, and in the idea of the union with the divinity or not, it's a state of separation. So it has those three basic meanings. So anyone who has not been joined to God through that divine grace and the restoration will always be separated to one extent or another from God. Okay? So that's the encapsulized answer. And so the, the term about limbo just means they're at the edge of this state of separation. But it's part of hell. It's part of that state of separation. Okay? Yeah, that's a good question. Are limbo separate? Are they suffering in limbo when they're separated? St. Augustine says there is a pene levissima. 
a most light pain, but they have some kind of, whether it's the knowledge. Not seeing God. Yeah. But of course, at the same time, that, that's, prob that's probably not the source of their suffering, because to see God is not part of our nature. All right? And on the day of the resurrection, those individuals will not feel pain that you are glorified in the resurrection because the glory doesn't belong to human nature any more than you get upset because you don't, have, you don't, you don't possess horse hooves and can run fast. It's just not part of what our structure is. And so seeing God is something that does not belong to us as human beings. This is an important thing we have to always understand. That's why we call it grace, call it a gift. And this is what Adam and Eve repudiate in paradise because they are ungrateful. They do not render praise, which is the essence of sanctification. They're not rendering praise behind it. This is St. Ephraim's um, portrayal of what's going on here. Okay? So, it is where we're introducing it. In fact, so like I said, these hymns... This is one of, this is, in this book, it's memory, it's memora number three. What these table blessings are, is it seems that the tradition that it was referred to in Corinthians of the agape, it's not a normal dinner, it's an institutionalized dinner that Christians would have. The agape means charity, so they would exercise it in such a way as to it was a practice that was done to reflect the Last Supper of eating together as a union, but it's not the Eucharist. It's a different thing from the Eucharist, but it's not a mere Sunday afternoon family dinner. Okay? St. Paul, to the letter to the Corinthians, it's another problem the Corinthians are doing, is that he says they're abasing the agape. They're basing it because the people who have money are just coming and they're bringing really nice food. And the people who are poor, of course, can't bring much. And they're not sharing at what should be the institution of recognizing charity among themselves. And St. Paul says, look, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? You're not gathering at the church to have this meal just to eat and drink, and therefore, because of this disorder, and they weren't waiting. You know, some of them just came with their own picnic, flopped down, and started doing their own thing instead of waiting for the assembly of the group together. So there's a number of different things that he he wants them to correct. And ultimately, this was dropped as a practice. And the agape. I mean, some Protestants have tried to restore it or something. They, they do something they call it agape. But the agape looks like it had continued in the Syriac church for much longer. Because St. Ephraim is writing blessings, hymns to be sung at these assemblies, at these, these gatherings. Okay? And that's what this hymn is. It's one of these poems. So it's in section 6 out of this one. It is more than enough that our father Adam became like the animals. All right? First thing. Why is Adam in the garden? to render conscious recognition of gratitude to God in the name of all of the other animals and creatures on the earth. It is more than enough that our father Adam became like the Adam, animals, since he ate fruit but did not give praise. So now the tree becomes an identification with his personal ingratitude. This is St. Ephraim's portrayal of the fall. It's very unique among the fathers of the church. But you'll see how he's going to turn it now. Since he ate fruit but did not give praise, may you give praise in everything. Indeed, he did not praise God, for as a rebel he had eaten more ungratefully than the animals who are obedient to their masters. There he's just pointing out that the birds of the air and the animals, they all do exactly what they're supposed to be doing as animals. They are perfectly obedient to the Creator. Human beings, part of our nature is to be conscious, to be oriented towards God, to be conscious, to be therefore also grateful. And especially in the union of grace in which Adam and Eve are created, 
That is what they're supposed to be doing. Instead, if you read Genesis, Eve starts discussing with the serpent, dialoguing back and forth, justifying things, and you know, the fall is not just the act of eating the fruit. There is a, the fall is initiated already by her dialoguing with the devil. Right? She's already rationalizing. This is what we see in every one of our sins. We rationalize why it wasn't that bad. That is the echo that I have mentioned a gazillion times since I've been here. That phrase of these people who will say to me, I'm a good person. If you, can try, if you go into what that good is supposed to mean, it means I haven't shot anyone, and I haven't stolen too much from my place of employment. I mean, after all, we, we all take staplers or a little bit of paper or some tape or something, you know. <coughs> an extra pair of gloves from the garage. Pens. And pens. And you pens. Know, we all, we all, so because we all do <laughs> that, I am, I am not a thief because that's what we're all... So I'm a good person. But what I, I give it to that because... What happens is, is in that rationalization, it's what you see reflected in Adam and Eve. And the next point is the refusal of responsibility for those actions. Adam, or Eve, it's portrayed as Eve talking with this demon. It becomes a rationalization. When God asks them, they immediately reject responsibility. And Adam says, well, it's because of the woman that you created. And the woman says it's because of the serpent. So none of them accept the responsibility. Neither one of them expect the responsibility, which is also that second stage in sin. Of course I'm living with the third spouse, who's not really my spouse, because my first spouse is still alive. But my first spouse was an ass. And so therefore, I'm happy with this one. But it doesn't resolve the union, the sacramental union of the first one. But I'm a good person. There's a rationalization. And then if you were to bring up the church's Christian doctrine on this issue, then they become angry. The rejection of the responsibility of the position that they're in now at this point in their life. It's just to give you, we do this all the time. That's why the sacrament of penance is so hard. Because it's a recognition that I've done something out of place, sinful, and a recognition that I have done this. I've mentioned to you before, in French, to confess one's sins is a reflexive verb in French. So you're literally saying, je me confesse, it literally means, I confess myself these, to, to have done these things. Right? And so <coughs> that recognition is exactly opposite of what you see with Adam and Eve. That's what he's saying here. They fall below the animals. Because at least the animals do what nature requires them to do, but the human nature, Adam and Eve, fail it. And specifically Adam. Again, this isn't Eve's. She's not the principal fount of original sin. Adam is. Right? And so they fall below the animals because the animals doing what the Creator gave them to do. Adam and Eve do not do what the Creator gave them to do. Yes? <clears throat> heard it explain how uh, <clears throat> Adam sh uh, should have been willing to protect his wife and guard his wife to the point of laying down his life as Christ laid down his life for his bride. Is that something that you... That's why Christ was called the last Adam, because he did what the first Adam should have done. And well, I suppose you could give it. I, I've never heard that before, but I suppose it could, be, it could be a... Scott it could Hunt be an interpretation, I suppose. But again, once Adam would know of her fall, there's nothing he can do to fix it. Right, but he didn't have to go take the apple himself. Though. No. And we don't say apple, we just say fruit. Whatever. Remember, we, no, because we did that, remember we did that last year. It's a pun in Latin. <coughs> it's the same word in Latin, which means evil, an apple. That's why it becomes an apple in the Western world. The Eastern tradition never talks about an apple. It's just the fruit, because it's a Latin pun. Because then it becomes the little kid's story about, here's your coloring book from Sunday school, and so because they ate an apple, we're all going to hell. And isn't that stupid? It's just like so stupid. Well, I, can't believe they believe, I can't believe they believe these fairy tales. Well, we, we, we do that, but I've given that 
coloring sheet. Well, there's nothing. No, no, no. And years, it's good you know? for the children. Yeah, but it's, but it's really also not good. good. But I, it's also, but it's good as they get older. Like I told the teenagers, I said, look, the, this is a pond model of apple. I mean, this is the reason why it's portrayed in the Western world artistically as an apple. I had one child in all the years I've done this look at me and say, I didn't know they had apple trees in the Middle East. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. Very perceptive. Well, and see, and people, well, see, even adults will say that, but they'll For do course. it as a way of being pejorative about the story, as if the story is about a tree, let alone an apple tree. Really, it's, it's ridiculous. Not. That's why I give you even the titles of these trees. What are trees? They're living things. What is the living thing that mankind is not to lay their hand to? Is the presumption to be omniscient, that we will know everything. That's the idea of good and evil. Adam and Eve are not stupid. They have infused knowledge. They know exactly the definition of evil intellectually. They don't have experience of it. But who needs to have an experience of everything to know that it's bad? The famous thing, you don't need to stick your hand on the burner on the stove to know that it will hurt. And if you have done that, then you're definitely guaranteed to know that it hurts. So, this is why this is very interesting about Adam and Eve, about the way that St. Ephraim portrays this. And you're going to see why he does this in a moment. So, but notice he says that Adam and Eve at that moment, just having just simply lost the friendship of God, they are lower than the animals. They are lower than the animals that Adam has named in paradise, in the garden. And then they lie to God, they reject responsibility for what they've done, they're standing there buck naked with an awareness of their buck nakedness, but again, before the fall, they knew they were buck naked, but they weren't lustful. It didn't become this fascination with sex that we have had ever since that day. And so what happens there is then when this questioning in Genesis that goes with God in paradise in the garden, the rejection of the responsibility, humanly speaking, they're totally abusing their intellects to excuse what they've done wrong, which they know intellectually they've done wrong. So they just keep digging themselves deeper. Right? And then, of course, once it's all said and done, God basically says, well, get rid of those stupid leaves that you're wearing. And he gives them clothing, and then they are sent out of the garden. You don't picture the idea that there's a gate somewhere when it's like, okay, and out of here, God ridden, slam, and goes the door in the garden. The garden is creation in its original state. The original state is wounded and is shattered because of what the priest Adom does. You know, link it to all the things going on in the Catholic Church today. When the priest falls in his priesthood, everything gets shaken. And Adam is meant to be the priest of all mankind in creation. So at that point, they are sent east. They are sent out of the garden. Paradise no longer exists. People say, we're going to find paradise. Doubtless, Adam and Eve lived in a geographical space. They have bodies. But it's not like there's some walled garden someplace that you're going to find where everything is still just waiting for people to come back after, you know, thousands and thousands of years. That's not the point. But you'll also notice that when they are sent out, they're sent to the east. They are sent to the place where light rises. And God gives them garments to better protect it than this kind of shipshlad, you know, leaves that they've pulled down to cover their bodies. And then that's the sending out of the garden. And that is why then the living reality within the garden called the tree of life is then guarded <coughs> by a watcher, guarded <coughs> by an angel with a flaming sword. Because it's not telling you God is going to be jealous and not let them get to this tree because if they get to the tree they're going to live forever. It's because life is now closed to them. When you read these things, they have meanings in them. Right? They're not, you know. But yes, when we're little, we color in the little pictures of the little naked people standing behind the bushes. But when you're in middle school, you need to be learning at a middle school level what that is. And when you're in high school, you have to know even more deeply what that story is about. And as an adult, 
Read St. Ephraim. Understand the destruction of the union and the power of sanctification which takes place in this. Yes? So, kind of odd question. Um, now where the uh, eternal life was closed off to them, did they have it before? Absolutely. That's being, they were created in grace. So they had eternal life, but then they basically threw it away. Absolutely. That's, that's the fall. Yeah, that's the fall. But St. Ephraim's giving part of this fall, which is they do not render this thanksgiving. So they are more ungratefully than the animals who are obedient to the masters. Since Adam did not praise, our Savior gave praise. Now the new Adam, what is the new Adam doing? He is going to exercise that priesthood that Adam failed in. Now notice that the idea is the praise and thanksgiving. So our Savior gave praise and he broke bread. So in Syria. That's the wakso, when the priest is like going around the host during the consecration of the mass. Wakso means, and he broke. That's why the priest is touching the outside of this altar bread. All right? So he says that since Adam gathered, he took from these trees, but he did not render thanks for what had been given to him. Our Savior gives praise, broke bread. But what is the very name of his death and resurrection in the sacred mystery? Eucharistia. Eucharistia in Greek means thanksgiving. That's what it means. So Ephraim is linking. Adam does not give Eucharistia. But our Lord comes and he praises God, breaks bread. He renders Eucharistia and gives us this possibility. And therefore the next line, as he had made restitution for Adam's debts, for his debts. And so over the bread he bestowed thanksgiving. Instead of the one who refuses to give praise, who will dedicate praise? For all of us was rendered this praise which our Lord sang. If we have not given thanks at our table, remember this is at the agape, it's the end of, the, the end of this hymn. If we have not given thanks at our table, his table does not welcome us. His table is the altar. If we do not, if we have not given thanks at our table, his table does not welcome us. But if we give thanks at our table, the good one will make us worthy of his table. So St. Ephraim spins the whole thing, not about obedience to law or all of these things, but he, he renders it in the question of praise and thanksgiving, and ultimately a priesthood. So we just wanted to tie this up because when we talk about the fasting, and this next part that we'll look at after the break, why do we do these things? You do these things because within your family, and the sacrament of matrimony, when the family fasts, and you'll notice the patriarch talks that the children of the age of reason should begin to be initiated in these things. You're sanctifying not only your household, but it's a holiness which will also extend out to the people around you. And so the fasting aspect winds up bringing in to unify the faster's spirit. That's why I say after Easter we'll talk about this doctrine of the two spirits. The fasting and the prayer and alms are meant to unify the faster's power of spirit, body, and mind. Because, and the second point is, it withdraws us from the fallen world. The world as it stands, you know, Mount Katahdin, as it stands, in all of its beauty, is not as beautiful as it originally was created, and it has not been sanctified by God. And therefore, as far as the church has seen, it's still part of the fallen world. Part of the fallen world means it's the domain of the devil. Remember when I told you in Europe all the major mountains have crosses on top of them? because the Catholics throughout the centuries redeemed their landscape. Redeemed. You find shrines all over the sides of the mountains and the hillsides of Bavaria. Because they are redeeming the land. They till the land. They render thanks to God for their crops. They bless their fields in the springtime. They give thanksgiving for the crops when it comes in. We have it with the whole blessings that we have around Our Lady of the Seeds. And then, of course, in August also, the blessing of the grains through the intercession of the Mother of God. It is a restoration of that churches, of that fundamental human reality that was meant to be there of priesthood. It removes it from the fallen world. 
When you become romantic about nature as if it's intrinsically holy and that's the place where you find God, that could not be more antithetical to the Catholic concept of the world and being cast out of paradise than if you try. Which is why that romantic notion of the world is the creation of Anglican Protestants of 19th century England. The whole romantic movement comes out of Germany and England in the 1800s. And so they start going to Switzerland because they're going to be in awe of the big rocks. Okay. So this is an important way to start thinking. So the second point is it withdraws us from a fallen world in order to bring this conscious service to God. And the third point is that this clarity of spirit right, allows the individual in their personal life as a channel of holiness. That's the reason why we fast the Poland. This is the priesthood of baptism, the priesthood of the faithful. It allows us, me, individually as a baptized individual, to become the channel of holiness. But then in my personal life, not just simply to be a channel of grace within my life, to have that impact upon the people around me. I can't sanctify them as such. But I can be a channel of that holiness and not only to be a channel that grace flows through me as a child of God, but that I can also, by the combat, by the escasis, by the training, become a reservoir. So that I am a place where holiness is reserved. It's a, it's a, it's a reservoir. And that reservoir means that I have an even greater richness through the example of my life. And this is the meaning of alms. Remember, alms is elimaisuna. Alms is, does not mean money. It means the works of compassion. Okay? So that's why to link all that together with Adam in the garden, that the priesthood of baptism, the priesthood that belongs to this priestly nation, which is the church, is to sanctify the temporal order. If you understand all of that, what it means is that as you're sitting there and doing your data entries into the computer, and it's really boring, your presence within that office is meant to be part of the redemption of the temporal order. You're a farmer, you have your fields blessed. That's why we have all these sacramentals of blessing fields and grain and grapes and everything else, is because 80, 90% of the population from most of the history of the world have been farmers. <laughs> And so, of course, they sanctify their temporal order. But the banker is meant to be sanctifying his temporal order of economic finance. I don't know how often that does it, but every one of those Catholics. But it, what it means, and that's why you start standing in awe of the Day of Judgment, is because that banker is going to be asked before the divine light, how was it that he redeemed the order of modern finance by his presence within it? We are meant to redeem the temporal order in which we function. A teacher, a banker, a farmer, a trash collector, whatever it is, that's the priesthood of the faithful. That's the priesthood of the sanctification of the temporal order. And again, understanding that, it's why the world changed so dramatically in the Greco-Roman world because it became baptized. And the entire thing in the pagan world was dumped on its head. Because that <coughs> sanctification was in the temporal order. And the last point, why we fast and alms and do prayer, is we sanctify this temporal order to make it once again a place of holiness. We have allowed ourselves to go into this perfectly dialectical antithetical vision of the 19th century of priest in his sacristy and the rest of us left alone. That idea the church is something distinct from the rest of the community. It's a perverse vision and it's certainly not a Catholic vision. Right? So that I'm Catholic when I'm at church and I'm just a banker when I'm sitting behind my desk. That's absurd. It's absurd when you stop and think about it. And it has never been the Catholic doctrine. You know? And that was the dramatic moment when John F. Kennedy, in front of a whole convention hall of Protestant ministers, told them publicly, well, my Catholicism won't have any way, anything to do with the way I govern the country. And you're like, <clears throat> got him elected, but it was also completely a different vision of Catholicism. 
right? So that's the idea. And then when you understand that, that's why we talk about this path as being a return to paradise. You're returning back to the order that Adam and Eve were created in originally, which was meant to be mankind's destiny. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that vision of St. Ephraim profoundly beautiful. Right? And profoundly hopeful, because it means our fasting and our prayers and our alms, our acts of compassion, are meant not just simply to ching, 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 ring up my place in heaven, as which is the way a lot of people look at it, but it is meant to start radiating out to a transformation of the temporal order, this world. That's how the world is redeemed. The world is redeemed by that banker behind the desk. No priest is ever going to walk in that banking office and say Mass on that desk. Right? It is sanctified by the presence of the sanctified who are consecrated, the saints who are at Rome, the saints who are at Philippi. That's what it means. He's not saying they're all morally great. I mean, we know from reading the letters they aren't all morally great, but they are all saints. They are all consecrated. Okay? Caffeine break, and then we'll come back to the Patriarch's letter. All right. So, don't worry. On the whole question of when we get to the when we get to the, the mysteries and we do baptism and that, we'll talk about all these questions, the theological conclusions, everything that flows from them, all that. So, before class started, Steve and I we were talking about the doctrine that there's no salvation outside the church, which is still a, still a doctrine of the church. So, there are there are doctrines which are defined and which cannot be questioned. There are theological conclusions that flow from them, but we'll talk about these different rankings and things. So on the point of limbo, limbo was just one of these theological conclusions. Because our Lord says clearly that you cannot, with, unless you be baptized again of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So that's one thing. And the church has always taught the necessity of baptism to enter into the deity of vision. Which is why she always had a great missionary effort to bring this great blessing to the rest of the world, to redeem it. That's the redemption. Right? But when it came to the question then of people who die before their birth or who aren't baptized or people who live, the question then becomes, well, what happens? And that's why the theological conclusion, if you want, technically what it's called, of limbo, why it's called threshold, it's still that state of separation. But anyways, we'll talk more about that when we get to the question of the mysteries um, in the book. So, now, let's go back then to the Patriarchs, the third section, which is on the fasting, which is probably the one that's the most shocking. No one has, I mean, there was enough shock in a sense with the idea of the mystery of penance, suffering, going to confession. No one has a problem with the middle part, which is pretty brief, just on prayer. But the section on fasting is the patriarch is laying out for us what has always been our tradition of fasting. Now, in the last 50 years, we kind of just started dumping all of it and ignoring it, but it's always been here. You know, it's quite fascinating. If you look at the, what is called the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Now, we have the new catechism, the Roman Catechism, that came out in the early 90s, 94 or something. But you can buy it in store. But pre prior to that, there was what was called the Catechism that came out from the Council of Trent in the 16th century. It was distinctly written for the parish priest, because it's a, it's a thick book, synopsis of all the doctrines. But what was interesting in it is, in the back, there's an appendix. And in the appendix, it, they give a breakdown covering subject matter, that if the priest did this, he would cover the whole doctrinal expose of the Catholic faith within a year. Okay. The reason why I bring it up is because the church has always seen this. You have to keep teaching. You have to always be explaining doctrines. We don't remember things. We don't remember things walking down the hall while I went into the kitchen. So the doctrines and the clarity of the gospel have to continually be taught. And the primary thing that the priest is doing in the homily is as teacher, as prophet, we use the term office of prophet, to teach. He's not there to entertain you. He is there to give an expose of what we believe, how we believe it, 
and deepen that continuum. So that in theory, somebody at the age of 97 has a more profound understanding they had than when they were seven. <clears throat> because they have now heard almost a century of this expose and the Gospels. And for us, it's even easier in the sense and more profound because you can really deepen it because our readings every Sunday, year to year, are the same. We don't go through this three-year cycle. And the three-year cycle for the Latins actually is also relatively new. Up until, this late, up until the 70s, throughout to the 60s, it had also an annual turning of readings. Every Sunday, every third Sunday after of Lent would be exactly the same gospel, exactly the same epistle, the same way we do with the Maronites. Because the liturgy is not a Bible study. This, a Wednesday, a separate time, is a Bible study. And that's why there's distinctions on a homily. A homily is when the preacher then is going to give you an explanation of the sacred text. A sermon is giving you an expose of the doctrine. A prone is an expose on a specific virtue. And a sermon may have nothing to do with the sacred text being read. Because we'll have a beginning and a middle and an end to talk about some doctrine. Next year, my third year here, is going to be all sermons. Because we're going to be doing the liturgical year and the vision of what we do, why veils and everything else that we do, why we do what we do. Because again, that has to be explained. Because if we don't explain why we do what we do, the first step is, well, then we just do what the Latins do. And the Latins aren't doing too much these days. And so we tend just to do... And then, of course, if we're never reminded to bolster up, then we all just kind of sink down simultaneously together. And that's why the idea of the week in and week out of the preaching is meant to be continually just to re-expose. That's the idea behind it. The subject doesn't change. It's always Christianity. <laughs> but you go deeper and deeper into it. Okay, that's the idea. And that's essentially what the patriarch's doing here. In theory, we all know what's in this letter. There's nothing new. There will be never anything new in a sermon. There will be no new doctrine. Now, it may be new to you, but there will be nothing new ever given from the pulpits. And when there is something new, that's when everyone starts howling. Remember? Patriarch Nestorius in Constantinople saying, well, Mary's not really the mother of God. You've got to think a little more clearly. There he was directly opposing the tradition. And I remember the reaction of the people writing to the emperor. Get rid of this man. Not an emperor we have, but we have no bishop. They wouldn't recognize him because he was violating the doctrine. Okay. So when the, basically what you have in front of you in this section on fasting is the tradition as it was canonized in a sense or specified from the early 18th century. You have what was called the Synod of Lebanon in 18, 17, uh, 1736, somewhere around there. And the Synod of Lebanon was like one of, it was like, it was the equivalent of the Council of Trent for the Maronites. It was the moment in which the entire vision of the church, right, of the Maronite church was being codified, categorized, unified in its practices and its disciplines. And that's what you have this fast. This is not something the patriarch is making up in 2018. This is something which he's reminding us of. And as I mentioned to you, I've had, you know, people who are immigrants who were born in, in, in Lebanon, yeah, they were eating all their fish and doing everything too. They were doing what the French Catholics did, okay? French Catholicism has had an absolutely gigantic, enormous influence upon the Maronite Church. All right, so, let's go look at this fasting. <coughs> Now remember, we mentioned that the fasting is a question of strengthening. In, in paragraph 17 here, notice what he puts in bold, is that what we're doing in these sacrifices and self-denial is not self-laceration. We're not punishing ourselves. It is an external expression of the repentance of the heart. This is an important point, because when we talk about the heart, we talk about the doctrine of the two spirits. Remember, the fasting is it allows us to be separate from the fallen world in order to sanctify the temporal world as such, to heal it, to bring it healing, not to be sucked down the vortex and just become worldly like all the rest of everyone else. We're meant to raise up. This is why our Lord says, you are the salt of the earth. Right? 
You are the light of the world. You are meant to preserve, enlighten, and raise up, not be dragged down. Right? And then he says, and if the salt loses its savor, what is it good for? You throw it out the window to be trodden on by the feet of men and animals out in the street with all the other garbage and sewage. And that, that is the envy, that is, that is the, when a Catholic is not faithful, they become the salt with no savor. And we have an axiom, corruptio optimi pessima. The corruption of the best is the worst. The lowest place in hell was first occupied by priests, and then after that is occupied by the Catholics. And everyone in hell will know that we are baptized, because they will see the character of the sacred mystery of baptism. Everyone will know that we are Christians. You can hide now in Hannaford. They don't necessarily know that you're baptized. Because right? you're not whipping a rosary over your head. But in hell, in the spiritual extension, and in the resurrection, we will know who was baptized. It will be to their glorious of radiance, part of their crown of the beatific vision, and part of the shame in hell. So, you know, there's pretty dramatic conclusions to these things. And that's why what the fasting is, is meant to be the expression of the conversion of heart that we've talked about in the first half of this letter. Okay? And he quotes from Joel the prophet here. Rend your hearts and not your garments, and return to the Lord your God. It's the prophets, the great prophets, Isaiah also and Ezekiel, of moving of moving the Jewish nation, the, the people of Israel, away from external observances and understanding that this is meant to be doing something internally. So that's why in the next paragraph, fasting is divine obligation. No priest, no patriarch, no, no pope could ever tell you, forget about it, you never have to fast. It would be a violation of the divine law. Okay? It's an obligation, has always been an obligation, and will continue to be as part of the divine law. It is an attitude of modesty. And remember, modesty comes from modus. It means a measure, a balance, a modality. So modus is a question, it's a question of balance and a question of humility before God. We recognize who we are before the divine majesty. Right? That's what fasting is meant to be expressive of. And an openness, and this is the key, an openness of the heart to the divine light. This is the disposition of the yesheri, of the, of the path of light, of life. Fasting, as we mentioned, it clarifies the mind. Right? And so it opens us to the divine light. Right? So this is really... Um, He's laying out the whole foundation of the thing. And of course, our Lord set the example. Yes? Uh, just how do you address it, like if someone has medical reasons why they... Well, it's yes. like their medication, so they have to do it. But as we mentioned, we talked to others who, you have to eat something with your medicine. You know, well, if a handful of almonds will work, then do that and you don't have to make an omelet. You know? So you have to eat something, but it could be, you know, what you actually, you know, the limit of what you need for your stomach for that. Well, I'm talking about more like... <coughs> diabetes or high glycemia. Yeah, that's part of it. it. It becomes medicinal at that point. You have to, you know, you have to follow the directions of what you need for proteins and that. So, yeah, that's fine. That's the medicinal aspect. All right? But again, we do, at that point, with the mentality of fasting, then we do what we need to do and no more. You know, because when you look at the directions, say, eat something when you take this medication, well, I could be sitting down for burgers and fries and a Coke and a Super Gulp and all that, and then an ice cream after, and I'm eating something with my medication, and it's like, well, I have to eat something with my meds, and it's like, well, yeah, but do you really have to eat that much? And you know, the answer will be, well, no, not really. So the fasting understanding is we would eat what is necessary for it, and but not expand it out for it. Okay? All right, next page. We have it as part of this divine law. You have, he doesn't have it here, but it's a reference to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 13, verse 3. When our Lord, when we gave the example last week, when we were talking about the fact that um, when our Lord was discussing about the death of some individuals who died, in, had died recently by the collapse of a tower, whether these people died because they were more wicked than other people, is that why they died? Because that is an Old Testament vision of things. 
And our Lord tells them, no, that of course it's not the reason why they died and other people standing, you know, seven feet from them didn't die from the collapse of that wall. But he says, but I tell you, if you do not do penance, you shall also likewise perish. He then lifts it to the level of, of the, the spirit. All right. Then in paragraph 18, he also mentions um, some quotations there, some of the things from Pope Francis. But one of the things I want to note is that towards the end, it's not the very last line, but you have like the second from the bottom. Fasting wakes us up. Fasting wakes us up. I mean, there's a reason why Uncle, Uncle, Uncle Sam, you know, unbuttons the top button on his, on his pants at Thanksgiving and then waddles over <coughs> to the sofa and then collapses, you know, because he has a surfeit of food within his belly. Now he's going to digest like a python. So when we fast, it has the opposite effect of not weighing us down, but allowing for us for clarity. Okay? And so, you know, putting it in the terms of fasting wakes us up. There is a clarification of the mind that takes place. And the clarification of the mind is not illumination. Illumination is the grace that we are open to by our fasting. All right. Almsgiving, number four. Now, actually, so I guess we didn't actually do this, did we? So, fasting, the word, excuse me, almsgiving, moi, um, eli moi suna, okay? Memorize it. E, L, E, long E, M O S Y N A. Ele Ele Moisuna. Ele Moisuna. Ele Moisuna. This is where our word alms really comes from. That's why I told you that alms is not plural and alms is not about money. It can be money, but alms is not about money. Everyone is obliged to do alms, poor or rich. Okay? Because what this means is, you know this because you always sing Kyrie Eleison, Eleison. The, the foundation of this word means compassion. All right? Kyrios, Kyrie, Lord, Eleison, have compassion. Lord, have compassion. The foundation, so the root of this is this Elei. So you know the word eleison, you know it as have mercy or have compassion. The word here, elemoisuna, literally means compassionateness. Okay? Compassion is... Compassionateness. 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 Right. Or works of compassion, if you will. You can say that. But so what happens is this word, all right, it becomes different things in different languages. So, Eli Moisuna, it's too much of a mouthful. So over the next 20 centuries of Christianity, you kind of like chop it up, right? So it's where the French, because oftentimes when you have an L, they make the AU, right? And then we keep the M, and then we have an O, and because we've dropped off the S, it gets a hat, but we still have the N, and of course the French, the first thing they ever did was like squash the last syllable, right? Always. And so, Eli Moisuna became Eli Moisunu, Eli Moisun, no pronunciation. But you put the N at it, so in French it becomes Omon. But in English, what happened to it, of course, is Eli Moisuna, became, we kept the L for the pronunciation in English, El Musna. At one point, Al Mes Almz. That's how you get alms. It has nothing to do with the jingle of change in a basket. Right? And in any case, the collection upstairs is not alms, it's justice. It's owed by the third precept of the church. <laughs> so technically, someone who's been away from the church for 15 years owes back money in justice. We never tried to impose that because it wouldn't work anyway, so why bother? In the Middle Ages, you would have been imposed that. 
10%, 10% was the tithing. If you didn't pay your 10%, you'd be excommunicated in the Middle Ages. So, you know. Question? Yes. So when it comes to like tithes and elms, so, you know, say if someone normally does tithe 10%, but then they are, you know, someone is needing that money because there are things that are, you know, things that are needed yeah, but again, for compassion. Um, so how does that, how does that end up affecting if the person doesn't have that money to give to the church because somebody else needs those tithes? Well, they first have an obligation to the apostle. Then. Is that what you're saying? Well, in other words, like, say, for example, having to uh, pay for a dumpster so that the, uh, the house can be emptied out because of legal responsibilities, well, so I don't have we can, We'll have to do that after. That's too, that's too personal. No, but I'm just giving an example. No, but I'm just saying in order to, we'll get definitely off in a tangent. We have 10 oh, minutes. Okay. Yeah. okay, but this is basically a very Jewish type of thing, you know, where this all happened. And it's not Jewish, it's totally Christian. Well, it's Christian, but what I mean, it's Israel, it's, it's that whole area. And here at the synagogue in Waterville, they have to pay a membership fee every year to join. They have, don't have you ever, haven't you ever seen Free Baptist Church or Free Methodist Church? No. Have you ever seen a title traveling around? You'll see Free Baptist. Yeah. So the, reason why, the reason why it's free is because that Baptist church told you we're not charging you pew rental for the year. Mm -hmm. So a dear friend of mine who was a member of yeah. this synagogue, her son has now had his bar mitzvah. He's out of college now. He's doing well. But she could not afford it anymore. They raised her pew Jewish. dues yeah, so Jewish, high, yeah. she had to say, I'm sorry. I can no longer be a member of the synagogue. Yeah. Now, how does that Well, she go and sit down with the rabbi and discuss that thing. I, I, I can't <coughs> but, answer that But stuff. you're saying alms and money and things like that. Whereas my thought the is... Church, the church has... To, well, so the, 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 the synagogue or the church has to be sustained. So there's an obligation in justice of all the baptized to sustain the apostolate. But my thought is the synagogues go back so far. Well, they always so, say, so the so law far. of Moses, you have... So you know when our Lord says, when you give alms, do not blow trumpets on the street corners? Yeah. Well, the law of Moses told you to do that. <clears throat> so that's why they're so shocked, because he's telling them, don't do what the law of Moses tells you. And the reason why you were blowing your trumpet is because you wanted to show the good example that you're giving money into the treasury of the temple. Can and that's the whole scene of the widow's might. When she goes up, the only they were just watching these people go up and put money into the treasury. And when they walk away, you know, they're blowing the trumpets. Doubtless they blew the trumpet when they, that, that lady went up and dropped her, her, her little penny in. And then when our Lord then says to the apostles, and of all of these other people, those, those, she's more meritorious because she gave out of what she, all she had, and the rest of them gave out of their superfluity. What happens to these people, though, if they choose to try to go to the synagogue, and they're so not... So you have to sit down with the rabbi. If you, what you do is you sit down with the rabbi. So you're not... You bring your W-2 forms if you really have to say, I can't do this anymore. I was just curious if they're even allowed in. I don't know. I don't know what the Jewish practice is. No, and not only do you have to donate, at the beginning of the year, Yom Kippur, they will read out the list of all the members oh, yeah. of the assembly and say how much you're giving. Oh, yeah, she said it's horrible. Because part of the Mosaic law requires that what you're giving to the purpose of the temple is also known because it's setting an example for others. But no, yeah, until, until recently, I mean, you had, well, when we have pews, you, since the 16th century, they have pew fees. Before that, you just had to tie. You had to give 10% of the church, or I said, or you'd be excommunicated. Then when pews came in, especially the Protestants were into the Catholics, they did also. The original reason would be, well, we have to pay for these pews, build them, right? So now you need to pay to use them. Now, if you look at all the ancient Roman churches and that, there's no pews in them. You just have a big open space. You want to sit, you sit on the floor. Yes? I've also heard some say that uh, you justice 5% to the local parish and then 5% to other apostolates of the church. How does that square? No, everyone should give one working day per month. That's 5%. We don't give 10% anymore because the, the state has stepped in and decided they're going to be, you know, Holy Mother State and do hospitals and everything else. And, you know, they're going to do all of those things. So 
because they're taking the other 40% of your income, the church has never insisted on 10, but 10 is the classic, prophetic, ancient law of Moses. It's been around for you know, centuries and centuries and centuries. Because the idea is, is God gives you everything. Return, return one part of that out of 10 back to him. And so that's the reason. If we'd been doing that for years, we wouldn't have the financial issues we have going on. So, and so what the church does, though, is the norm should be 5%, 5% in five working days a week, four days out of the week, that's 20 working days, more or less. So that's one day would be 5% of what your income is. That's why it's easy. To, if you say 5%, it's like, oh, this is so confusing. You say, okay, what you make on one working day per month should go in the basket or be automatic deduction from your bank. But then you recalculate, I buy my lottery tickets, I want to go to the movies. Those come second to what the first obligation is to the apostolic work of the church. But uh, in generosity, um, we are encouraged to give more than Oh, yes. No, no, no. To Over other apostolates. Yes. Or... yes. But the idea of the 5% is what you give to your local apostolate. Right. That's what you do. Yeah, I mean, you can give as much away as you want. Yeah, you know. And, but anything outside, that's the very minimum that should be given. And then we decide that we're going to send money to, you know, the, the Lausanne's or to African missions or adopt a little, a little black baby like they used to do. You know, so that type of a thing. All right? But, all, but the, the thing is what's important on here is that alms is not about dollars and cents. Which is all the more reason to understand that the collection is not alms. You're not doing a service to the church because you throw two dollars in. Right? That may be the only thing that we have, and that's fine, and that may be my five percent if you want. Right? The big thing is, is to understand that's a question of justice. When we're talking about alms here, this is over and above. This is helping the little old lady down the street because she needs a ride to the doctor's office. That's alms. That's an act of compassion. She needs a service, we render the service, we do that. It's over and above. We're showing alms just means that we have a vision of loving our neighbor as ourselves. Okay? And the Lenten, the Lenten aspect of alms is that we're considering our lives of where we're at. And so alms is linked to the fasting because what is historically the practice is the money that I'm not spending on my normal grocery bill. I don't just pocket and go to the movie. That money that I didn't spend on groceries because it's Lent, I didn't buy the 15 cakes I would normally buy in a two-month period, that money of the 15 cakes I would give to the homeless shelter or give to some other charity institution. And you can give it to the church if you want. At that point, it's over and above, considering if you're doing the 5% in the first place. You know. So that's what, if you want, and dollars and cents on it, but that's not what this is limited to. This is limited to do the look upon my life of how attentive am I to the needs of those around me. That's all. So tithe is money, alms is helping others. Tithe is 10% rendered back to God. That's what tithe means. That's what diamond means. The French word dime, dime, means a tithe. That's why we named our little coin after it, because it's one-tenth of the dollar. Dean. So it's a dean. And then a quarter. So that is, um, that's the aspect behind it. So like I said, up until relative to the last 200 years, the norm was always time, a 10%. Okay? And that's why our Lord, uh, in the Gospel, he says, look, you, you tithe everything. You tithe the weeds in your field. You tithe the mint and stuff that comes up with your crop. You're growing barley and things that other grow, you also take 10% of that mint, he says, or the parsley growing in with the grain that you're growing. And you give you 10% of your barley. He says, and that's fine, you know. He says, but you have forgotten, and then he quotes from the Old Testament about mercy and <coughs> compassion, and he says, you have forgotten those things because there's no law about being, you can't put a law on being merciful. And so he says, you have forgotten this part of the prophet's teachers. You should not have not, he doesn't say that you should not have forgotten this while doing the other things. He says, don't tithe. He says, don't not tithe. He says that you should be doing that, not consider yourself to be sufficient because mercy is greater than sacrifice. That's the alms out. And so in Lent, what we're doing for two months is we're considering our attentiveness 
to those around us. Okay? And the basic principle here is God is never outdone in generosity. Okay? When we, we worry about things too much, God will never be outdone in generosity. Our Lord said to the rich young man, Look, you want to be perfect? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Was that a bad deal? Hard to say that it would be a bad deal. But the young man doesn't do it because he was rich. And he walks away. And that's the context when our Lord says that it is easier for the camel to pass through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's the context of it. He says that as the young man is walking away from him disappointed. He told that explicitly in the gospel. And we're also told in the gospel of St. Mark that before our Lord says any of that to this young man, we're told that our Lord looks at this young man and he loves him. We're never told that about him. We know Martha, Mary, and Lazarus are the ones that he loved. And of course, St. John always refers to himself as being the beloved disciple. Other than that, someone coming up in the crowd, he looks at this young man and he says, you've asked me about the kingdom, but I tell you if you want to be perfect, there is something missing to you. Sell what you have. Give it to the poor. And then come follow me. And he walks away. And when he walks away, that's when our Lord says, it is easier for the camel to pass through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't reflect well upon that young man. Okay? Any questions? Because I guess we're going to have to come back to the fasting throughout the year on Easter week. Any questions? Because I wanted, we're going to talk about these calendrical fasts. That's what's important. And then we're throughout the year. You know, and we'll describe why... The question of the, the quality of the, of the foods that we're eating and not eating during that time. Okay? All right. So next week is the rite of the lamp. I highly encourage you to be there for this healing ritual. And then, and it's all new this year. They just sent us a translation of the ritual of 1942 from the Syria. The right of the lamp. Wednesday at 6 6 30. 30. Okay, we'll finish with the prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. O God, you are before all ages, and you exist from age to age. You are resplendent and glorified in unsearchable light. Through your word, bring you forth the light and give us each day. O radiant day and source of all light, we glorify you, we adore you. And offer you praise night and day. Accept our prayers and answer our prayers. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of the other side. To him, with you, and the Holy Spirit, be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Glory to God. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us in every course for you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.